In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Our Lady, Mother of Mercy, St. Joseph, St. Faustina, our patron saints and guardian angels, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, we continue to wish you all a blessed and happy Easter because, of course, Easter Day is celebrated as an octave. So on eight days, because the first day of the week, which is Sunday, is also the eighth day, because eight days later is another Sunday. And the eighth day was always seen the day of that never ends. So that's why the church would celebrate many times different octaves. Not just the Easter octave, but there's a Christmas octave. There was an octave for, Pen for a Pentecost. There was an octave for Corpus Christi. There was an octave for Our Lady's Assumption. Because this whole thing about celebrating, taking eight days to celebrate something was to remind us that of that feast that's never going to end when we get to heaven, that eternal day that will never end. So that's why it's important that we have on this eighth day, this eighth day in the octave of Easter, we celebrate Divine Mercy Sunday also, to call to mind this great act of mercy on God's part, that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, so that those who believe in him may have eternal life. You know, we even see that in the responsorial psalm, and it says, uh, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love is everlasting. But you notice what it says in the responsorial psalm. It says, it says, his mercy endures forever. That synonymous with our Lord's love is mercy. That his love is the expression of mercy, because mercy has come down to our level to raise us up. Mercy is always that kind of com compassionate, looking down on the sufferings of others and wanting to relieve them. And of course, the greatest suffering that we had was the fact that we did not have the opportunity to enter into heaven. And our Lord loved us so much that he wanted us to receive that great act of his mercy that he wanted to offer himself for love of us. And so even Pope John Paul II, when he wrote his great encyclical, one of the first ones that he wrote. First he wrote one about our Lord as the Redeemer of all mankind. The second one was Dives in Misericordia, rich in mercy. That the God, of, the, the God the Father is the Father of mercies. That he looks down upon us and wants to not condemn us, but that he wants, as he wishes all men, he wishes all men to be saved. God is our greatest ally. And, you know, we heard in the first reading in the Acts of the Apostles, and many signs and wonders were done among the people at the hands of the apostles at the early church. And that it's astounding that even the shadow of Peter or the apostles, if they were to even fall on someone who was sick, that they would be cured from their illness. They didn't even have to touch them. God so much wanted to show and to draw people into his church that he worked many miracles at the beginning especially, but of course the church is still working miracles and is still bringing about miracles every day. Of course the greatest miracle is to bring about our Lord present on the altar here in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. But these kind of like sacramentals, you know, even they said they would touch cloths to the apostles and take them off to dif distant people and touch them and they would be cured. These are signs of sacramentals. These are not sacraments instituted by Christ, but they are sacramentals, things that dispose others to faith and that in disposing to faith also bring about miracles because we need, of course, faith to receive and to work miracles. And so what is the sacramental? Well, we see them, of course, holy water. We know the rosary is a sacramental, the brown scapular, the miraculous medal. But even this 
recent sacramental in the church's history, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, is a sacramental. It disposes. What does it dispose us to? That we have trust in God's mercy, that we believe that God is merciful, that even in the midst of great trials and sufferings and that sin does not have the final say. Even we have that second reading from the, from, from St. John, from the book of Revelation. You know, God even gives us a preview of what's going to come, showing that the battle has already been won. What to expect at the end times, and so that we do not lose heart, knowing that, oh, this is the way it's all supposed to work out. Yes, there's going to be trials and conflagration and a big battle, finally, at the end times, but in the, in the end, God wins to give us that great confidence and trust that even if we should have to suffer for the love of God, we will be victorious. Suffering and death does not have the final say. That's why we celebrate every Sunday is the call to mind the resurrection, that we should never forget that. Many times, as you know, it's easy to forget. The devil would love us to forget. God's love and mercy, that somehow to doubt, is God really as good as he says he is? And many times that we see so many people fall away from the practice of their faith because they cannot understand, why does God permit good people to suffer? Why does he permit evil? If he's so good, why didn't he just stop all the evil when he died on the cross? Well, he didn't stop suffering but he gave it a noble purpose. Of course, now it has redemptive value. It now has ability not only to bring about the destruction of the evil one, but our sanctification. Suffering is not, is not the final word. That if we endure trials and tribulations, that we are going to be victorious and that we will as St. Teresa of Avila. You know, when you think of what the saints are truly different than us, they don't think like us most of the time. We don't think like the saints. You know, St. Teresa of Avila said one time after she, she when she, she saw St. Peter of Alcantara after he died, he appeared to her in all of his glory, and he did so many penances, St. Peter of Alcantara, that Franciscan. They said he was an athlete of penance. He would even think of things to deny himself and to suffer for love of God. And he told St. Teresa of Avila, he said, you know, he said, if you, if you see the glory that I have now, he said, it's all because of all those penances and self-denial that I did for love of God when I was alive. And St. Teresa of Avila said, if you were to see that glory, you would pray for more sufferings in this life and not less. But most of us are saying, oh, Lord, just give me what, what you can. I don't want any more, but just help me to get through what you've given me already. But that's not the way the saints think. The saints are almost kind of looking for things that they can suffer for love of God. We pray that we would have that kind of mentality, that kind of disposition, that we not look upon suffering as, you know, something that is to be, make us sad and downcast, but is an opportunity to be identified with Christ, who so much loved us that he embraced a life of suffering. And St. Paul reminds us, he said, did you not know that when you were baptized, that you were baptized not only you know, into his new life, but you were baptized into his death? That by our baptism, not only we called to live the life of Christ, but also to, live, to die with him and to be identified with him. And of course, that means that we're going to also have to undergo trials and tribulations, just so that we have an opportunity to prove our love for him. It's easy to say, oh, I love you, Lord, when everything's going well. But when things are, when you're on the cross with our Lord and you can reach out and say like the good thief, whose name, of course, you know, Dismas said, you know, uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your paradise or into your kingdom. And he says, this day you shall be with me in paradise. That we have to have that confidence that if we are under the same suffering as our Lord is under, that we also will receive his reward. 
and his share in his glory. That's why St. Francis said, I glory in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, imitating St. Paul. And of course, on this Divine Mercy Sunday, we should call to mind, what is the mercy of God? You know, today I would sad to say there's a kind of a false mercy out there. It's not really mercy. Sad to say there are many in the church who are promoting this false mercy, this kind of somehow that the mercy is somehow not, you know, that somehow we don't admonish the sinner, which is actually one of the corporal, it's one of the spiritual works of mercy, to admonish the sinner, to tell them that they're doing wrong and that they need to repent. Somehow we, we don't want to tell them that. In other words, we want, to, we want to tell them that their sin is no longer a sin, that it's okay, just keep doing it. We can't redefine things. Sin is still sin. What we want to do is to bring them to repentance, that they will know that their sin has put Jesus on the cross. He has suffered for love of them. And we know that at the end, our Lord is going to come and judge us. And we hear from Matthew 25, verses 31 to 46, you know, what does he say to them? You know, I was hungry and you gave me to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me to drink. He lists the corporal works of mercy, but that doesn't mean that the spiritual are not important. But it is saying is in that passage is that if you're not even doing the corporal, you're probably not even doing the spiritual. Because we're more inclined, of course, to do those tangible things, those very material things. But we want to be able to at least do those corporal works of mercy and even more so the spiritual works of mercy. Because those are the ways in which we are able to show that same kind of love that God has for us. He saw it, us in our needs, both material and spiritual. Of course, we know the corporal works are to feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty. I'm not sure why those two are divided. You would think that hungry and thirst would go together, but they're divided. To clothe the naked. You know, today, to clothe the naked would be just priests preaching the importance of modesty and dress today. That would be a big wonder. You don't have to think about the natives out in Africa who are wandering around with no clothes on. You find them in the local malls. Clothe the naked. Shelter to the homeless. Visit the sick. Ransom captives. And those captives may not just be those who are being held hostage, you know. There was a story, I remember one time reading in Reader's Digest about this man who was, this crazy man broke into their place of work where he was, and this man had a sawed-off shotgun, and he taped this sawed-off shotgun to the back of this man's neck and held him hostage. And you think, he was thinking, how am I going to get out of this situation? I have a sawed-off shotgun taped to the back of my neck. And... Um, Eventually, he was able to free himself and, you know, before the guy could have blown his head off. But how grateful he was to those who rescued him. You know, we had something worse than a sawed-off shotgun. We had hell looking straight in our face. Those who, you know, before our Lord came and died for us on the cross, we didn't have any hope of eternal life. And yet our Lord came and rescued us. But to ransom captives, especially those who are captive to false ideology, captives to their addictions, whatever they may be, that the church is there to ransom them, to help buy them back by their, all the others, the spiritual works of mercy, and to bury the dead. It's always been a merciful thing to bury those who, are, who have died. And so we want to um, always remember that when we go to take care of those who have passed from this world, that we give them a proper burial, give them the dignity of, of a child of God, and that we understand that, you know, even today, people don't understand the importance of the bodily resurrection. This whole notion, you know, that all of a sudden everybody wants to be cremated. I think it's a, a, a movement of the devil, especially among funeral directors, that they're all moving people to, they want to make it so expensive for you to bury your loved one in a casket that they want to entice you, oh, just, you know, it's cheaper to just cremate them. But that loses sight of the whole point that the body is important. 
The body is not something to just throw away. That body is going to be given to you again on the last day. Not another body, but that body. And even if it should be lost at sea, it's going to be found again and put back together again on the last day. So I would encourage you to be mindful of that, the importance of bearing your loved ones and giving them the proper dignity that they deserve even in death. Of course, then, the spiritual ones is to pray for the living and the dead. We're always asking people to pray for us and to pray for our deceased relatives. That's an act of mercy because we know they need prayers, especially those in purgatory. And that's one of the, the reasons why the Divine Mercy Chaplet is to pray for those who are dying, that before they die, that they receive God's mercy. And I would encourage you, you know, some people have gotten lazy. And some people have given up praying the rosary because, oh, I like the Divine Mercy Chapel, but it's so much easier. I don't have to say all those words that I have to say when I pray the rosary, you know. And they think that it's just like, you know, I get it done in 10 minutes, maybe even quicker than that. I think that um, don't, be, don't be throwing the rosary out because you think the Divine Mercy Chaplet is a substitute. No, it's not. The rosary is Our Lady's sword, which she uses to crush the head of Satan. The Divine Mercy Chaplet is to invoke God's mercy, especially on those at the moment of death and those who are dying. But do not become lazy. Don't you pray the Divine Mercy Chaplet and the rosary. But don't, um, don't, um, don't let sloth be un under the disguise of, of devotion. To instruct the ignorant. That's an act of mercy. Today we're leaving people ignorant. We're, even, we're not even instructing them. We're, even, we're deceiving them. Especially in public schools. And the whole agenda that is being promoted there. We're to instruct people about what is true. Counsel the doubtful. Oh, am I really a man or a woman? That would be a good thing to help them know who they are. You know, not to lead them down the, the, the pathway of mental illness. Today we're rewarding mental illness instead of helping people to get them thinking straight, being in touch with reality. Admonish the sinners, I said, is a, a great act of mercy. Bearing wrongs patiently. Forgive the offenses willingly when someone offends us. What well, of course, of course, our Lord gives us that great example from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Comfort the afflicted. So many times we have friends and neighbors. Maybe they are afflicted with some kind of sorrow. They have a loved one who is treating them badly. Whatever it may be. Whatever their affliction, you know. That's where the church came up with all the hospital system is because the church wanted to, in the meantime, to bring about relieving of physical suffering because it knew that that was an opportunity to give comfort to those and to relieve that suffering and so that they would not, you know, ultimately, you know, physical suffering can easily dispose one to despair. And of course, the hospitals were invented to bring them Relief of suffering to remind them that their suffering is not wasted. And that that's another thing that we could do more instead of trying to end people's lives prematurely is to let them see that their suffering has value. Maybe the most important event that happens in their life is the sufferings they endure before they die. To purify them of their sins, to do their purgatory now and not afterwards but also to offer that suffering for the conversion of sinners. That, that would be a great miracle right there. And of course, as I said, to pray for the living and the dead. And of course, all the sacraments. Of course, our Lord, when he appeared to St. Faustina, the red and white rays, he said, symbolized the blood and water that flowed from his heart on the cross. All that, all the sacraments, are channels of God's mercy. Of course, the first mercy was our baptism that incorporated us, freed us from our stain of original sin, made us children of God. And then, of course, confession, that fountain of mercy 
that God has given for us poor sinners that if we should fall especially into mortal sin after baptism that he can bring us back to life spiritually an important thing about confession why is it so important is that in confession in the sacrament of penance what is sufficient for absolution is imperfect contrition meaning sorrow for your sins because you dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell if it wasn't for the sacrament of penance, you'd have to have a perfect contrition. It means you're sorry for your sins, mainly because they have offended God whom you love. And we know sometimes fear is more of a motivating factor than love. And God is so merciful that he only wants, he only asks for imperfect contrition in the sacrament of penance. Of course, we want to strive for perfect contrition and deepen our contrition, but that's so important why you should also have a priest at the bedside of your dying relatives that they receive especially the sacrament of the anointing of the sick that's another great sacrament of God's mercy and of course the priesthood in that God brings us himself in Holy Communion through the hands of the priest so today as we celebrate divine mercy that we want to place in God's hands and his merciful in that ocean of his mercy not only our sins but the sins of the whole world which right now they are mounting up and you think wow that has to be quite an ocean of mercy because it seems like we're trying to fill up his ocean with all of our sins the way our, our world is going we pray that those who are doing all these evil works particularly ourselves, that we not receive his punishment, but his mercy. That means what is necessary for his mercy is that we repent. We're not asking that they get away scot-free. They have to repent. Everybody has to repent in order for them to receive God's mercy. That means they have to acknowledge they have offended God and that they're sorry for offending him. And that those who are leading others astray, what did our Lord say? That they would have a millstone put around their neck. If you want to start a budding industry, you could start making some millstones because I think there might be a, quite a few needed. You would not go out of business, I can guarantee you, because there are so many people who are leading others astray. We want to pray that they will repent before they receive his justice because this is the time of mercy. Now is the time to say, Lord, have mercy on me. You won't have time when you go to meet him on judgment day. That's why the power of the church's prayer is so important. And that divine mercy chaplet is that you're praying. Maybe that person doesn't have the grace to ask for that mercy at that moment. But our impetratory power of the church, the church pleading on behalf of poor sinners, can obtain that grace for them. And that we should be imploring God's mercy on all those who probably right now we who are frustrating us and making us so angry because of their evil. But we want to pray that they will repent because we do not wish that anyone should go to hell. We want to pray especially as the church, which is the visible sign of God's merciful love on earth, that we are praying for the conversion of poor sinners, not confirming them in their sins, but praying that they be converted from their sins. Our Lord hung around with ex-fornicators, ex-adulterers, ex-drunkards. He didn't condone their sin. He absolved them of their sins. And he said, go and sin no more. Let us pray for that grace, especially today, for all those who are in need of God's mercy, beginning with ourselves and ask Our Lady, the Mother of Mercy. You know, St. Maximilian Colby said that we as poor sinners, even though we hear those beautiful messages of St. Faustina about God, how Christ is so merciful, St. Maximilian Colby said, we may still may be hesitant to approach our Lord because we know that he's supposed to come at the end of the world to judge the living and the dead. So that we might think, oh, he's still the judge. I don't know, I might be hesitant to think that he's as merciful as he is. 
And so St. Maximine Kolbe said, Our Lord gave us his mother, who is all mercy, that if we should even hesitate to approach Jesus, he has given us his mother, that all poor sinners know that she is the source of God's mercy, that she is the one who's dispensing his mercy because he has given everything to her from the cross. Behold your mother. She is the mother of mercy who has been given to us in the most agonizing and excruciating moment of her life at the foot of the cross. And that what is the name of the order that St. Faustina belonged to in which we received this great devotion of divine mercy? Our Lady of Mercy, the sisters of Our Lady Mother of Mercy. That in one sense, of course, Our Lady doesn't say, for, you know, atonement for our sins, but we could surely hear Our Lady praying at the foot of the cross, for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. So she is praying that on behalf of all of us poor sinners. Because she, of course, received the greatest mercy of God. His grace of the Immaculate Conception that he gave to his mother. You know, St. Therese of the Child Jesus one time, one of the, her sisters said to her, Oh, Saint, oh Sister Therese, you probably can't sing the mercies of the Lord like St. Mary Magdalene because you have done nothing wrong in your whole life to offend God like St. Mary Magdalene. She was singing the mercies of God because she had seven demons driven out of her. And St. Therese said, no, my, by far, I can even sing greater the mercies of God. She said, who's more thankful? The one who has stumbled on a rock and hurt themselves and then has been, you know, picked up and dusted off and maybe bandaged their little wounded knee or the one who God looks out ahead of them and removes the stone out of the way so they don't stumble. In many ways, that's kind of like what our Lord did for his mother in that he preserved her. And so, therefore, she is the one who knows what is the mercies of the Lord and can sing them forever and be the true one to dispense those mercies to the rest of us. Because, of course, he preserved her. She never had to stumble into the devil's dominion. Let us ask Our Lady, as Mother of Mercy, to teach us to have that great confidence that we hear from that devotion and on that picture that could truly be the words of our lady from the good friday to easter sunday jesus i trust in you that's our lady's confidence that comes from that deep faith that she had that the lord's words to her would be fulfilled she never doubted not like recently someone saying that somehow our lady was blaspheming god no she did not she never doubted god's goodness even in the midst of such horrible things, she trusted in him. Let us ask for that same trust and confidence that Our Lady has in Jesus, our Lord and fountain of mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.